I'm just editing the second part of the restoration tour at East Kirkby given by Andrew Panton on NX611. I'm going to split this into two as my computer doesn't seem to like to upload large files onto YouTube. They will be both appear on YouTube on the same day. Uh, if you noticed last week when I was editing the first part, I was shown with my great working pullover on. Uh, when the wife saw it, she was quite disgusted with it. And putting that on YouTube, it was, just, it was a terrible state of affairs. So put a bit of pullover on, got me rivet club by John, done me hair. And that should earn me a lot of brownie points when the wife sees it and enabling me to go to East Kirkby this week. So thanks for watching. Bye. Okay, so moving from the turret, uh, the other big projects are the wingtips. Um, the wingtips are about nine feet by eight feet. I would love to be able to show you one, but I can't because um, the wingtips are basically in boxes at the moment. Um, so I'm going to show you some of the parts of the wingtips. So when we took the wingtips apart, usually on this aircraft because of its history and where it sat at Blackpool and so on and so forth, we found the port side of the aircraft to be in worse condition than the starboard side. But just because the wingtips were different to that, the starboard side was worse than the port. Um, what we found with the structure inside the wingtips is none of it was painted. So it is just the blank aluminium, no protection, which has meant that we've had quite a lot of corrosion on the, the skins and uh, all of the formers within the, uh, the wingtips. So they've been completely bust down again like this section was, all the rivets taken out, all of its component parts, everything assessed, and then new, new pieces made where required, which has meant the wingtips are about 75% new material because of the amount of corrosion we found inside them. The wingtip, it was quite a surprise to us um, with how it was actually produced and the thickness of material that was used in it. Because the wingtips are right out of the edge of the wings, they have to be strong but they have to be light and they also have to be able to move a lot. I don't know if you've ever been on an airline or going on holiday and you've seen the, the wings rise, the wings flap effectively. It's the same on a Lancaster. So although everything is riveted together, it also has to be able to move. So on the wings, the top spar contracts or is compressed and the bottom spar stretches. So there is a visual stretch of the material as you take off and the load on the wings. The fuselage sinks within the wings basically as the wings stretch up because of the weight of the aircraft. Um, so all this material in the wingtips is very light because of where it is on the aircraft, but it's also very strong. And it's the first time we've seen the construction method used um, that is used on these wingtips. So I'll, I'll hopefully try and explain how they actually go together. <coughs> so the wingtips are held in the jig vertically. So the bottom of the jig is the face that attaches to the wing and the top of the jig is the wingtip. So where the, the bottom of the, the jig is, so where the wingtip attaches to the wing is, is this. This is part way through production. But this is a set of two extrusions. So an extru extrusion at the top, an extrusion at the bottom, and the web in between. The web is this, this sheet metal here. And then it bolts onto the wing through a series of holes and then studs on the, on the, the edge of the wing. These have yet to have the, the holes put through the extrusion. Um, the original extrusion, we've had to replace the extrusions on them, so this is an original piece and you can see the big holes in there, so that's where it bolts onto the, uh, the wing with wing studs. And then from this, this web and extrusion going upwards are the posts and spars, and then between those are the ribs that sit between them, and then in between the spars going up are smaller sections uh, called stringers that go up. So we've had quite a lot to replace on these, including the extrusions. We used the, the British company to make the extrusions for us. And we decided to have a full aircraft set made. So there's two extrusions in each wingtip like this, and then the two corresponding extrusions in the wing that butt up against it in the edge of the wing. So there's eight extrusions 
and they cost us £10,000 to have new extrusions made. And these basically come out of the, the die, the extruder, flat, straight, or straight should I say, but in the same cross section. And then they have to be sent off to be shaped. So, not, this is a, not the best one for the curve, but if you, um, if you look at the top of this, it's got quite a big curve in the extrusion itself. So it comes out flat and then it's sent away to Simone Cunningham to have the, uh, the curve put in it. Again, that's, that's put in a, a set of jaws and the, the inner face is, is compressed, which then stretches the outer face and puts a curve in the material. So when the, uh, the item comes out of the uh, die, out of the extrusion, it's in a soft state. It's then shaped and it's sent back to them to be heat treated to make it harder again. So I think it's come out at, if anybody knows material specs, it's come out at T4 and then it's been heat treated to T6511. Which basically gives it a bit more strength, it makes it a harder material. So coming up from that web and extrusion are the spars. So these are, are riveted to here against the, uh, the flat face. So they come up and then is introduced a very different method of production to what we've normally seen. It's a little bit like a jigsaw. So you've got your spar and then you've got your rib and they actually slide into one another. See if I can get this to do this. So they, they interlock until they're flush and then they're riveted together with, with right angle plates. We've never seen that before on uh, an aircraft like this, of this age, um, but it's all to add strength. Usually what you find is these ribs are actually made in individual sections between the spars and then riveted together. But this makes it an awful lot stronger while it also being light. And you can see this spar's got a lot of big holes in it. Those are actually called lightning holes. So it's a hole cut in the material and then the edges is stretched and bent over so it makes it awfully strong, but takes out a lot of material, therefore reducing the weight. So in between those again, we have what we call stringers. I thought I'd got a stringer. Uh, the stringers are, they're like an aluminium which is uh, bent to an L shape and then it's got a further kick off the top of the L to add extra strength. We've had to have a lot of those made again um, and they've got a, a strengthening piece riveted inside of those. What they found with early Lancasters is the wing tips would fold up. So the wing tip where it meets the extrusion, it would actually fold up and back onto itself and they lost quite a few of the very early Lancasters like that. And so we suspect that this strengthening strip that was put in the stringer was to actually counteract that, that folding up of the wingtip. Um, we actually have one of the uh, a crash wreckage here of a Lancaster that had the wingtips fold up and then crashed because of that. It's actually documented that that was the cause of the crash. So at the moment the wingtips, the port wingtip is much further on than the starboard wingtip. Um, because of the quantity of material we've had to have reproduced and remade, uh, we asked them to concentrate on one, one wing tip first when they were making the material. So we've had all of the, the port ribs and uh, stringers and everything come back. Um, so that's going through paint now to be built back up. And the starboard one, we're waiting for probably about a third of the items left to come back for it. Um, and the, the chap's gone away on holiday, believe it or not. I can't understand it. <laughs> it's not helping us at all. Um, so when he comes back on holiday, we can finish that part of the project. It'll all come back to us, which will mean we'll do a circular route back down to the south coast and back up again to collect all the items. Um, and then we can uh, fit everything into the jig again, get it painted and then start to rivet it to get together. I would expect probably a fortnight we'll see the port wingtip getting riveted together in its structure. And then the skins will be um, finally fitted, trimmed and then built up as well. Um, on the, the leading edge of the wingtip, we have the leading edge, which is basically a very thick piece of uh, aluminium formed to go around the leading edge. There's two pieces of leading edge. This is an aluminium piece, 
and then coming up from that towards the tip was a steel piece and that was part of the barrage balloon protection. So barrage balloons in the UK, a big um, floating balloon on a cable, the cable was to stop aircraft from flying low over particular parts of the country. Um, of course they're also dangerous to allied aircraft um, so they had on Lancaster they had barrage balloon cutters on the wing tips on the on the wings and they also had reinforced wing tips with a steel section and that steel section is really to protect the wing tip from the cable of the um, the balloon so we didn't pull the wing tip off for want of a better way of putting it but the problem with putting a steel leading edge on is you get the similar corrosion so this is one of the skins off the top of a wing tip and you can see exactly where the, the steel leading edge started and the, uh, and the aluminium one finished because you've got this dissimilar corrosion again. So this has meant that where all the, the skins fit with the, the steel leading edge, all those skins are scrap, purely because there was no protection put between the two. In modern practices they would be painted and they would have a jointing compound put between the two materials as well to stop this, this dissimilar corrosion. We found quite a few instances, um, both in the fins and rudders and the wingtips, where the original method of production has instantly meant the item is no longer airworthy, um, purely because of the way they built it. But of course, these aircraft coming off the production line were only expected to last about 40 hours, something like that, not 70 years. So we found quite a few situations, and you can see in the, uh, if you're very keen of eye, in the, uh, the edge of this, where there's what we call a snowman hole. So there's a, a double hole creating the shape of a snowman. Mm. Mm. And this is basically where the pilot drilled where they're going to put the rivet, and then when they've drilled to put the rivet in, they've missed the hole. It's a big no-no nowadays. Uh, but of course it didn't matter to English back then because they weren't working to the same standard they had to get it out of the factory and onto frontline service. So along with some corrosion on this, that has obviously made, that made that part non-airworthy in today's standards. So believe it or not, when this aircraft is finished, it will be far superior in quality to when it originally rolled off the production line. And when you consider the sort of damage that they received and came back again on operations, it just shows how over-engineered um, these particular aircraft were for the work that they were doing. Um, I was going to send something else around, wasn't I? Turn that around. You'll see some corrosion on that and you'll see the, the bigger hole.